Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime on Western Europe's democratic age, 1945 to 1968, written by Professor Martin Conway. My name is Maria del Pilar Blanco and I am the academic champion for networks and partnerships here at Torch. I'm delighted to welcome Martin Conway to speak about his book today. Also on the panel today are Professor Mark Mulholland, Professor Stadis Kalivas and Professor Patricia Claven, um, who will be chairing the discussion. Western Europe, uh, Europe's democratic age asks why and how Western Europeans were converted to democracy after 1945 and how even in the face of Soviet power, such democracies endured and flourished to such an extent that by the 1960s, the democratic identity of Western Europe seemed irreversible. Martin Conway's book explores this fascinating sea change in Western European political norms. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Professor Clavin, who will chair the panel. This will be followed by some brief comments by Martin, by Professor Conway. Afterwards, um, our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We will then give Professor Conway the chance to respond to the discussion. And then the event will conclude um, with questions from you, the audience. And I ask the, all the audience members to please pop their questions in the Q&A box, which appears at the bottom of your screen. And we also recommend that you get those questions in as early as you can to avoid disappointment. So it's a great pleasure to be here to introduce this fourth book at lunchtime in this academic year. Book at Lunchtime is Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions. This, week, this term is uh, weekly. And we also have a range of commentators with each, um, with each presentation. Please do take a look at our website and newsletter for the full program next term. So all that's left for me to do now is to thank you all for coming and to introduce the speakers on today in today's book at lunchtime. So Martin Conway, whose book we are celebrating today is professor of contemporary European history and McClellan Warburg fellow in history at Balliol College. Martin's body of work has focused on 20th century European history. He is the author of a number of books on aspects of mid 20th century um, Europe, including uh, one of his books is The Sorrows of Belgium, Liberation and Political Reconstruction 1944 to 1947 that was published by OUP in 2012. And he recently co-authored a collective study of post-war periods in European history entitled Europe's Post-War Periods 1989, 1945, 1918, and that was published by Bloomsbury in 2018. Patricia Clavin, our chair for today's panel, is Professor of International History at the University of Oxford and Zeitlin Fellow at Jesus College. Her current research explores how economic, social, and even environmental issues took on as much importance as familiar concerns of border protection and weapons control in the search for security after 1918. Her recent books are Securing the World Economy, The Reinvention of the League of Nations, published by Oxford in 2013, and Internationalisms, A 20th Century History, edited jointly with Glenda Sluga and published by Cambridge in 2017. She is a fellow of the British Academy and a foreign member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. And now onto our panelists. Mark Mulholland is professor of modern history at St. Catherine's College here in Oxford. His research interests cover Ireland since the, fa the, famish, the famine, sorry, and the history of political thought since the French Revolution. His publications include Bourgeois Liberty and the Politics of Fear, From Absolutism to Neoconservatism, published in 2012, and The Murderer of Warren Street, The True Story of a 19th Century Revolutionary, published in 2018. Stadis Kalivas is Gladstone Professor of Government and Fellow of All Souls College at Oxford. Until 2018, he was Arnold Wolfer's Professor of Political Science at Yale University, where he founded and directed the program on Order, Conflict and Violence and co-directed the Hellenic Studies program. In 2019, he founded and, direct, and directs the T.E. Lawrence program on Conflict and Violence at All Souls. He is the author of such titles as The Rise of Christian Democracy in Europe, published by Cornell in 1996, The Logic of Violence and Civil War, published by Cambridge in 2006, and Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know, published by Oxford University Press in 2015. So now I hand it over to Patricia and I will come back uh, at the end to field your questions. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Maria. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone this afternoon, and I'm delighted to um, introduce my friend and colleague Martin Conway uh, and his eagerly awaited wonderful new book. And I think without further ado, I think we're all anxious to hear from Martin, you know, something about the new book and, and, its, and its key arguments. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you to everybody, indeed, for organising this event and for part, and for the to the participants for to, for joining the panel. Um, yeah, democracy has a history. That might seem a rather obvious trite point to make, but it seems to me that it's one that we need to make right now. We need to make it for all sorts of reasons, and not all of those reasons are in North America. Those reasons are also in Europe, West and East, and indeed across a broader world where the issue of democracy seems to have become in many ways an issue of contestation, an issue of discussion, an issue of debate. Why? Well, because I think we're trying to confront the turning from the 20th into the 21st century and a recognition that probably we've entered an era of much more uh, contest around democracy a phrase one might use about various things that have been happening in North America, but also elsewhere, is it sort of democracy without rules. And so the purpose of my book and the purpose of the, the, my talk today is simply to take us back to an, a bygone era and to look at how democracy worked differently in a past era. I'm a historian, I'm not a political scientist, unlike Statis. I don't claim that what I'm talking about has a direct relevance for the issues around democracy today, but I think it's useful to go and look at this very particular moment in European history after 1945, when Western Europe, Eastern Europe was of course a different story, but in Western Europe, there was what I would regard as a very decisive watershed moment of the adoption of democracy or of a particular model of democracy as a hegemonic political system in Europe. And as a preface to that, it's important to remember just how unsuccessful and how violently opposed democracy had been in Europe prior to that moment. This isn't just about the Third Reich, it's about the way in which something like 1848 had not given birth to a, a period of progressive mass democracy in Europe, or indeed, as every student knows, that 1918 was not the, be the German defeat was not the beginning of a democratic age in Europe. But 1945 was. Why should that have been? So trying to address that question took me in various directions. First of all, I think it took me towards elites. Why is it that elites, by which I mean essentially politicians, civil servants, military figures as well, administrators, why do they adopt democracy after 1945? And they do so, I think, because they've seen the costs of authoritarianism, they've seen the dangers of it, they've seen the battles that have resulted from it, and they see in the adoption of a rather managed, careful structure of democracy after 1945, the prospect of a more um, temperate political order, but also a political order that will not threaten uh, the ghosts of mass politics, be that communist revolution, or indeed fascist demagogy. And it's this attempt to construct a rather managed political sphere in the center of the political spectrum that lies at the, lies at the heart of the very deliberate attempts of people in France, in Germany, in Western, in Italy, in the Low Countries after the Second World War to create a new sort of democracy with the emphasis always on the new, the sense that perhaps there is a historic heritage that lies behind the adoption of democracy, but the techniques, the systems, the structures, the proportional representation, the structures of welfare, these are all going to be emphatically new. And so this is a top-down structure of creating democracy, and one that rather to, my, to the surprise perhaps of contemporaries, and certainly perhaps to the surprise of historians, works. Democracy works in post-war Western Europe because it creates a more structured form of government and of state power, the integration of majorities into the exercise of power rather than minorities, the avoidance of a winner-takes-all culture, the adoptions of systems of proportional representation, the celebration of a certain sort of corporatism whereby unions, employers and other interest groups such as farmers are brought into the structure of making decisions. And it goes beyond that also into bringing citizens into government, into democracy. And in a way, the citizens come last. 
the top-down creation of new constitutions and new state structures in Western Europe after 1945 takes a number of years. But it's from the end of the 1940s with the first post-war elections and the creation of a rather predictable, if not entirely stable, parliamentary order in most of Europe, that then the people can be allowed in. And the people, of course, are now a very inclusive category, including for the first time in France, Italy and Belgium, uh, women. Indeed, if one remembers that actually democratic political processes had been suspended or abolished in much of Europe over the previous years, then there is an emphatic, almost overwhelming majority of new voters in Western Europe after 1945. And these, most obviously the women, are people who are coming in to democratic politics with clear demands, with clear incentives to see the state operating in their interests. And of course, the state can't please everybody all of the time. But part of the success of governance in Western Europe after 1945 is that it creates a sense that actually people, voters, citizens were getting more out than they were putting in, that taxation was perhaps rather more disguised than expenditure, and that they could see around them new structures of welfare, but also infrastructure of transport networks, schools, um, sewage systems and all the rest that make people think that they are in some sense in a negotiation with government. It didn't mean that they liked their rulers. It didn't mean that they even thought their rulers were necessarily doing the right thing, or indeed that they wouldn't protest against their rulers in the street. But there's a drawing of people into a democratic structure, which starts at a political level. But I think by the end of the 1950s had become a much more profound transition towards seeing pe towards people recognizing themselves to being Democrats, including people who might indeed vote for communist parties. They see democracy as the game in which they are engaged and also recognize that in that certain sorts of rules. It is indeed a rather limited democracy that doesn't empower people, that seeks to celebrate a certain sort of intellectual public debate, but at the same time seeks to keep people off the streets and serve certain interests such as the middle classes and farming interests more than those of the working class. And at the heart of that is of course what's going to happen in the 1960s, which is where my book um, goes to in its final chapter, which is the emergence of a broad spirit of contestation, of rejection, of the limits of democracy. But let me emphasize that, emphasize that point of limits, because this is not about people leaving democracy or rejecting democracy in the way that might have occurred in Europe in the 1930s. This is about, about opposing the way in which democracy is not broad enough, not wide enough, not inspired sufficiently by new radical ideas entering Europe in many ways from the global south. And what you enter from the 1970s onwards in Western Europe is a much more contested and indeed in some respects more violent period of democracy, a sort of post-democracy, in which I think, as we can now see, for the last 40 or 50 years, Europe has been seeking to move towards a new, a new model of democracy that might work for a changing, a very changed European society. And what's quite interesting and perhaps quite evident in the, the contemporary debate about democracy is a sense that we haven't yet arrived there. And that's what I think the book ultimately is about, the lost world of a certain sort of democracy. Thank you very much, Patricia. So it's my turn to um, uh, have this opportunity to comment on this book. And I would like to thank the organizers for um, the invitation and the prompt to read the book that I found uh, to be fascinating. Um, the political scientist on this panel uh, and political science is part of the argument. And I'm going to say a few things about that. But I'm also, among political scientists, I get, I guess, uh, much more uh, historically sensitive or oriented. So I approach these kinds of works, not just um, uh, with uh, very much sympathy, but also uh, they find them a great opportunity to learn um, and to, to plunge myself in, in the details of how concepts that we approach very often in a very abstract way have their own life and tell us much more than uh, it, we see on the surface. So I'd like to make um, three general points about this book and raise a number of questions. And these are going to be, first of all, the, the question uh, and the approach of the book. The second one is going to be about the nature of democracy. 
uh, in post-war um, Western Europe. And the third one is the way the book, I think, uh, resonates with um, current debates and, and uh, in a sense, uh, feeds into, uh, I think, a necessary and productive thinking uh, about the nature of democracy in general. So on the question, um, as Professor Conway said, uh, this is an attempt to contextualize uh, something that a lot of us have taken for granted, uh, which is the emergence of democracy uh, in Europe, in Western Europe in 1945. The assumption is, well, the war ended, uh, the Cold War divided uh, Europe into two spheres of influence. In a sense, the East um, grew in uh, resembling uh, the Soviet Union and, and the West inevitably uh, grew to resemble the United States and, and Great Britain, the, uh, the, the winners of the Second World War. And, and that, to some extent, is, is, an, is a sort of very schematic and, and not necessarily incorrect understanding of what happened, but it simplifies very much. So the book contextualizes uh, the process of uh, the birth of post-war um, uh, European regimes, democratic regimes, and, and gives us a sense of what kind of democracy these were. Of democracies these were. Um, there were two uh, points of interest here for me coming from a perspective uh, that emphasizes very much um, the sort of messy politics of violence and conflict, which is in 1945, the situation in Europe is still very chaotic, very unpredictable and very violent. Uh, and in fact, there's been an emphasis, uh, uh, I think, on works that look at this violent birth of democracy uh, for example, in the last 10 years, there's been quite a lot of research uh, on uh, the very high levels of violence exercised um, in Northern Italy, for example, by former resistance against former fascists and um, all this um, um, background of violence uh, that existed uh, at that time in Europe. There's uh, a set of very nice books, including some more journalistic, but uh, very interesting approaches Ian Buruman's uh, Year Zero, for example. And so to look at um, the flip side of that uh, is refreshing uh, in a way because we haven't had enough, I think, um, to look at the process of the nitty gritty of setting up functioning working regimes uh, that eventually lasted. Um, and there is, this, in a sense here, a bias violence makes you know, more news, attracts more attention, produces, you know, feeds more research but the nitty-gritty sometimes uh, boring processes of uh, the construction of new institutions uh, do not have this kind of flashy uh, aspect and i think the book uh, here is, is a major corrective to that and in fact when you look at the nitty-gritty there are so many questions that pop up on how these institutions were set up and in, in ways that uh, made them durable and i think the book gives us a lot of um, detail and food for thought on, on that kind of process. So the book is uh, contextualizing the process of uh, the creation of democracies. It gives us a sense of how pre-existing elites, in a sense, an infrastructure in terms of um, ideas uh, and personnel that already existed helped make this transition possible. And it also, of course, reminds us of the importance of looking at the other side, uh, having seen the abyss and how that motivates you to move in certain directions. And I'm going to return to that in a moment. So that's the first, I would say, general comment about um, what the book contributes. The second one, I think, is a, a very deep reflection on the nature of uh, uh, democracy in post-war Europe. Uh, and I would say that the main thing that emerges, uh, if, I, I, if I want to use one word about what kind of democracy it is, would be the color, it's gray. In fact, there is a series of adjectives uh, that characterize uh, this democracy. Uh, it is run by elites. It, the, their objective is to have a tempered um, democracy, a managed democracy. Uh, they're characterized by caution, by maturity. They're sober. Um, they want to drain the passion out of political life and have a regime that works and operates in disciplined ways. They want to make a revolution within the law, revolution dans la loi. They don't want to experiment. Certainly, they want to plan everything, economics as well as politics, to produce predictable outcomes. There is a sort of very strong technocratic element. And of course, here comes political science with its public opinions, especially American political science with its beliefs in 
you know, stability as the most important good uh, to, in a sense, provide the intellectual underpinnings of the democracy. It's a middle class regime uh, that emphasizes order, order liberalism uh, comes in uh, in the Germanic areas. Uh, there is a fear of crowds and there is a fear of any form of instability because it's seen either as harking back to uh, the interwar years of instability or the war itself uh, and the perils of uh, fascist Nazism, and of course, uh, the, the peril that is represented by communism. Um, in a sense, there is an analysis in which both fascism and communism are perversions of democracy, and therefore democracy has to be, in a sense, protected. So uh, when one reads at that, one is tempted to, to, um, to be critical about this new regime, since it has all these attributes that we've come to, um, to understand as being, if not negative, certainly not very attractive. I mean, who likes gray, right? And so the question here is, um, how did they manage to organize a regime that uh, had a great deal of uh, popular legitimacy, given those characteristics? And I would say there are probably two answers to that. One is that there seems to be some evidence, at least from my reading of the book, that having a sort of unified message about what the regime was like, in a sense, resonated. Uh, in a, you have arguments in favor of uh, how and why democracy must operate in such a way that, that are adopted because there isn't any strong uh, counter argument. Uh, in fact, communists were, um, marginalized even when there were mass communist parties they couldn't really break out of their uh, in a sense restricted camp and, and the extreme right uh, was uh, extremely limited in what uh, they could accomplish so in a sense the center was was prevalent intellectually as well as politically and so that is one explanation for why uh, this democracy was able to operate and the second explanation of course uh, is that um, this is the period of the Cold War, and on top of it, uh, it's accompanied in the West by uh, very high levels of pro prosperity. And, and therefore, this is a democracy that delivers, that produces this sort of uh, social mobility uh, and social advancement that, uh, that people are demanding, uh, and, and that matters. So these would be uh, two arguments to explain uh, why these types of institutions uh, even though sometimes may uh, appear not to be too appealing, uh, are uh, perceived as very attractive. The third uh, point that I want to make um, is how is this model of conservative democracy speaking to us today? What is there to be learned about it? And I think that the discussion resonates in, in more uh, than one ways because we seem to be living in what um, the book concludes is, is an era of post-democracy that emerges uh, in the late 60s uh, and is exemplified initially by the demands articulated around the May 68 revolts for a different type of democracy that's going to be more generous, more open, more radical, uh, more uh, comprehensive, uh, more embrace, em embracing of, of people who were left out, less gray, more colorful, less planned, more crowded. Uh, that will be everything that the previous one was not, uh, which is still, you know, uh, something that is being demanded. Uh, it seems like an open-ended process. So in a sense, the book assumes some sort of potentially uh, linear progression and opening up. And here I, I want to raise um, a question about what are really, what is this, the, the logic of the democratic progression as um, in a sense prompted uh, by the, the West democratic experiment. Um, and I would argue that perhaps uh, we're not looking at the, it at a linear sort of progression, but more at, at the sort of um, cyclical one. Uh, it may be that the dialectics of democracy or indeed dialectics that we have a process uh, of, of cyclical recycling in which every new stage includes elements of the previous one, uh, but not necessarily uh, in, in a way that was expected. So in a sense, uh, let me complicate a little bit uh, the scheme that is um, assumed, or uh, I can infer at least from, from the conclusion of the book, and say, well, we have, we start with, with 20 years of very stable, very conservative, very centrist, very limited, but at the same time, very predictable, uh, very much accepted and uh, very successful democracy that is challenged in the late 1960s. 
And, and the challenge, of course, comes from all kinds of perspectives. There are people demanding more. Democracy should be something more. But at the same time, a lot of these people uh, pro provide agendas, provide um, um, programs and, and demands that um, are actually threatening to democracy. Uh, so I, I cannot think uh, that the Cultural Revolution or Maoism, for example, would um, enhance uh, democracy. And, and this is really what appears on, on the surface. And of course, it's a period of, of violence. It doesn't stop at the crowds in the protests of May 68. What succeeds uh, these revolts uh, is uh, in some countries at least uh, a process of armed contestation especially italy and germany go through uh, very difficult years uh, in which they have to face almost existential questions and it is also argued that uh, even though may 68 in france ends up relatively uh, in a manageable way with the elections um, and the uh, support for, for general de gaulle and, and his party uh, things came very close to unraveling uh, there are a number of studies showing that uh, for uh, at least a few days in, in May, the situation uh, appeared to be very difficult to contain. So there is, in a sense, uh, a situation in which those demands are accompanied by, by real threats to democracy. But what we get at the end of, this, of, the, of the day uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, is a mixture of the previous model of conservative democracy, but also of a more, much more fractured or fluid political situation, a messier one, which uh, I think is, is made worse by technological change, the advent of television as a, the primary means of political mobilization and the decline of political parties, uh, the mass parties, uh, that is in the replacement, the so-called cartel parties. So we reach then in another stage, we have this differentiation and, and that is 1989. And after 1989, we get back into a period of democratic optimism. Again, democracy is not the same, is not what it used to be in the first 20 years, but it is still centrist, quite stable, seems to be working. There is a sense of optimism that this model is actually exportable and it does, it, it, is, it is being exported to, uh, to Eastern, to Central and Eastern Europe. And so we have another 20 years uh, that are, I would say, centrist. And then uh, we are in the period we live in uh, now with the advent of populism, which is, in a sense, a replay uh, of the demands of the 1960s. On the one hand, you have the demands for broadening, broadening of the agenda, you know, uh, occupy Wall Street, uh, more people should be expressed, direct democracy, but then also the reality of the threats, which are the populist movements uh, that are motivated by very different ideas, even though they take the mantle of expressing people who are left out or believed to be left out, people who think of themselves as being marginalized, and that is expressed in the way we know. So the question here that uh, we might be prompted to ask is if it is indeed a process of dialectic um, synthesis, whether we're at the moment in which we, we're expecting to see um, a return to that centrism, uh, as opposed to a sort of descent into something that's much more chaotic. And I'll close by saying that I was struck um, uh, by uh, the remarks in the books, which, which also re resonate with my own observations of how the period of, of, of the late 60s, 70s and early 80s is a period dominated by democratic pessimism. You have a, a slur of books about how democracies might die, might commit suicide, and they very much reflect the books that came out after 2016. So when one goes back to history, one sees um, a lot of reasons to be cautious about um, arguments that predict mass and secular change and perhaps um, draw um, a bit more optimism and hope by um, this kind of cyclicality. So I really enjoyed reading these books. I got many ideas out of it and, and I'm very happy to be here discussing it. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to this, inviting me to read this book, which I read with a great deal of pleasure and uh, enlightenment, I think. Um, I'm going to raise some questions which uh, Martin might wish to address, but I think also just useful questions to think about when reading the book. Um, uh, first of all, it's always interesting to know um, 
how somebody comes to write a book. And I did uh, for some time a uh, uh, work alongside or work underneath Martin when Martin was chair of the uh, history faculty board. Um, so I'm curious to know to what extent that the practice of democracy and management, which of course such a job requires, was illuminating for looking at the much larger picture of Europe's uh, post-war democratic moment. Um, Martin, a number of times in the book, evinces a scepticism about whether Western Europe really exists as an entity or whether it exists as a new entity. Um, nonetheless, it's clear from the book that there are conceptualizations of Western Europe. Um, the a Abbott Land, the um, uh, conservatives speak of the uh, kind of twilight land. Um, a, or a new place, Western Europe, uh, this kind of sense that Western Europe um, meant something historically, yet it's one which Martin says comes to an end in 1989. But of course, for the actors of this period, it has a very long history, um, traced back at least to Charlemagne, um, and for the left in particular, traced back to the French Revolution with its uh, recapitulations, reenactments. Um, a, in 1830, 1848, where clearly Western Europe does look like the, um, uh, if we accept Hungary as the kind of um, storm center of that, um, a, again in 1918 to 1920, or maybe as late as 1923, uh, the post First World War democratic moment. Uh, it seems that both left and right do have an imagined community, which is Western Europe. Um, one which is important because it distinguishes them from um, a, the republicanism of the United States or the constitutional monarchy of Britain, which means that the claim of Western Europe that they kind of invent democracy, I think in their own minds, has a certain reality. Um, it's a democracy which is based upon learning lessons from the past. And Martin himself points out that a, uh, when the democratic thinkers of the post-war period um, are cogitating on their um, tasks, uh, they look to Weimar, uh, the, the failures of Weimar, they look to the failures of the Third Republic, they look to the failures of Italian transformismo, um, that democracy emerges uh, in a particular way out of, a, out of a history, which is a history of Western Europe. Um, Another point uh, Martin is very skeptical about is um, any notion of 1944 to 1946 or thereabouts uh, being something which can be likened to a democratic revolution. Um, and he makes a compelling argument for this. Um, he also has uh, evidence which may lean a little bit uh, in another direction. Uh, he speaks of Italian peasants speaking of the period uh, of liberation as being um, a rastrel amento, um, a kind of harrowing of society, uh, by which was meant really um, something which was profound and traumatic in its own revolutionary way, which was a fundamental reshaping of the internal mechanisms of the state. Um, and this was done um, through purging. Uh, it was a and the kind of rough justice that everybody gets embarrassed about um, at the end of the, in the last period of the Second World War, during the liberation and shortly after the Second World War, uh, this rough justice which sees, um, yes, um, people being uh, shamed publicly in the streets and their heads shaved and so on, but much more importantly, people have been fired from governmental jobs or from jobs in business um, or from the, civil, uh, uh, from the bureaucracy in general or from the media. And there do, we do actually see quite a fundamental repopulation of the personnel of the state. Um, and this seems to me something which in some respects does look like a revolution. In fact, the most difficult part of any revolutionary process is how do you remake the state apparatus on the hoof? Um, a, Mark Mazzaro says, it's hard to imagine a genuine democracy flourishing anew without the punishment of its enemies. And this is a period, it seems to me, that uh, we can see a certain revolutionary dynamic, which is the punishment and the extirpation of the enemies of democracy, 
who, um, before the Second World War, despite the, the democratic movement of 1918, had remained, remained ensconced in the um, state apparatus. And indeed, after the, um, uh, the Nazis come to power, um, the German SPD kind of make the point uh, that their mistake had been, as they put it, it was a grave historical error on the part of the German working class, bewildered as it had been during the war, to take over the structure of the old state without transforming it. It seems to me that 44 to 46, 47, there is a transformation of the state apparatus, but it's done in a controlled way, which doesn't lead to uh, a kind of revolutionary civil war process. Why? Because of military occupation. And in this regard, we might see the end of the Second World War as being something akin to the English Glorious Revolution, a revolutionary transformation, but one kept within bounds because of um, a, an external military force able to hold the line. Um, my next point uh, 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 is a point Martin made where he says that dialectical history is perhaps rightly unfashionable. Nonetheless, he wants to hold to it and to hold to it in that to understand the democratic moment, we need to understand both social democracy and um, a Christian democracy, um, a, the remade Catholic democracy. Um, but, he but Martin doesn't want to simply present this as two pillars, um, both holding up the pediment of democracy, but distinct from each other. The dialectic implies a conversation and a reshaping of both by either. Um, and uh, I'd like to see reflection up, upon this. I mean, we can see a history of this, um, both negatively, uh, the clear potential for socialists and the Populari, the popular party in post-First World War Italy, um, the clear potential for both these parties, which had a lot in common uh, to hold the line against fascism feeling because they can't agree over socialist anti-clericalism. Um, perhaps more positively, from 1916, the German SPD, the Socialists and the Catholic Centre Party, from 1916 are in effect in some kind of alliance and retain this alliance for much of the Weimar period. They are the kind of foundation states, uh, parties of the Weimar Republic. Um, perhaps more ambiguous, uh, but uh, I think significant in Austria at the end of the First World War. The Socialists win 40% of the vote, but they go into governmental coalition with the Christian Socials, the Christian Democrats, uh, and the Socialists form a, a kind of a new quasi-Marxist theory of, um, a, a, of equilibrium, of an era of equilibrium with the classes are in equilibrium, which is reflected by the alliance of the socialists and the Christian socials. Um, this, of course, falls apart, but it's indicative, I think, of a prehistory of this dialectic. And I'd be interested in what Martin might have to say on the ideological components of this dialect, uh, dialectical, um, not merging, but a cohabitation of social democracy and Christian socialism after the Second World War. Uh, it, it seems notable to me that the Catholic Church's last major statement on the social question, on the worker question, had been uh, quad, uh, quad, uh, gesimo anno, which is basically a kind of um, softly um, fascist uh, analysis of the social question, very different from Rerum Novarum, which had come out in 1931. There isn't really a profoundly new statement for the Catholic Church on the labour question until Laborum uh, Exercens in 1981. Um, so uh, I'm interested in if there is a dialectic uh, of ideology, how this dialectic takes shape and how social democracy and Christian democracy form and reform each other in this democratic period. Um, a, Martin also makes the point about the significance of the post-war democracies in Western Europe resting on the social alliance of the middle class, the lower middle class and rural electors with the exclusion of the working class. I think clearly there's much to this that varies from one country to another. Perhaps the uh, working class wages are held below productivity uh, increases most significantly in France and in France, of course, is where you have a major working class rebellion in uh, 1968. Um, 
but I think it's interesting to reflect upon. Um, part of the reason why working class wages are held below, below productivity increases um, is because of the recomposition of the working class. Um, that wages are held down because there's lots of new workers appearing, particularly from the former peasantry becoming urban working class. And of course, these former peasants, new workers, are in general much better off um, a, uh, as they become workers. They are being paid much more than they would have been paid, let's say, as agricultural labourers. Um, so it seems to me that uh, the latent working class uh, agency and power is still there throughout the period, um, but it only becomes uh, reaches something like a, a crisis, if I may use that term, or climacteric in the 1970s um, because of the profit freeze, that really the um, space for increasing wages but keeping wages below productivity comes to an end in the 1970s when profits begin to be squeezed. And that's when you get a fundamentally new problem, if you like, for Western European capitalism, which is the taming of this latent working class power, the breaking of the trade union power of the working classes. Um, and finally, and I, uh, just a, a short brief point, but recurring a little bit to the question of the dialectic, um, a, uh, Martin makes the point that there are people who are anxious to re-envisage democracy by the time we get to 1968. Um, but keeping with this dialectical theme and perhaps, push, perhaps pushing it a little further than Martin would entirely wish it to be pushed, I wonder if this is a question of um, the contradictions of Western European democracy um, coming to fruition and seeking a way to work themselves out into a new synthesis. And uh, a quotation which stares with me comes from the United States, actually. But Bob Speck, who is one of the leaders of Students for a Democratic Society, the far left organization, um, said in 1968 that a lot of people were beginning to talk about what should take precedence. Should it be human rights or property rights? And he went on to say, there's a hell of a lot of people who can go either way on that. And it seems to me that's actually quite indicative of what's going to develop, that within democracy is the question of human rights and property rights. And in some respects, what happens in the subsequent decades is not that one or other is prioritized, um, a, a, is prioritized, but rather both work themselves out in a certain dynamic. The rebellion of the taxpaying middle classes in the, from the 1970s in particular, uh, in terms of property rights um, and in human rights, the rise of identity politics of a feminism, new way of feminism, uh, gay rights, um, a minority rights, and so on. Um, and it seems to me that these are elements which had already been uh, part of the West Democratic European settlement, um, a, but there are contradictions within the settlement uh, which come to a, um, which build up and explode from 1968 onwards before a new kind of settlement has arrived at a broadly neoliberal settlement for the 1980s. Uh, I enjoyed this book uh, very much. I'm sure Martin couldn't hope to deal with all questions I tried to raise here today, uh, but I'll be interested to hear any reflections he might have. Thank you very much to everyone. Many thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, and, and may I add my voice of congratulation uh, to Martin uh, and, and thanks to the, my fellow panellists, really. I think what's really marvellous about this book is that it's a book to think with. And all the time I was reading it, I had the impression I was reading too quickly. Um, and I don't think I was. I think the problem was actually it's just it's just so rich in insight that you want to chew over <laughs> over so much of it. So you know, it'll definitely be a book I'll return to again and again. I want to focus my remarks really um, in relation to how Martin has made me think about my own field of expertise, which is really more situated in the field of international and global history, though I've written about Europe. And what that means is perhaps in contrast to my fellow panelists, I tend to go from the world, from the outside of Europe towards it. And that's probably partly because many of the things I've worked on are to do with money and trade, which just sort of swirl around. 
And, and so I want to sort of reflect a little bit on how Martin has helped me connect some of those strands up in the way that he's presented uh, the arguments in his book. And it's very difficult to summarize his arguments because on the one hand, he did it very eloquently. And as you'll have, you can tell, Martin has a very distinctive voice, both as a speaker and also as a writer, uh, which is just fabulous. Um, so where Martin begins his story, and it's with someone who surfaces a number of times in the book, is with a, a brilliant French intellectual, Raymond Aron. And Aron writes um, important works on, on democracy and on Europe uh, from the 50s, 60s. He actually does his thesis work on, on Franco-German relations in the 1920s. So there's the same sort of chronological connection also between Martin and Aaron. Um, and Aaron also writes on international relations and in 1962 publishes a seminal text, War and Peace, a theory of international relations. And where he asks this incredibly important question, under what conditions would men, okay, didn't get this bit quite right, but what conditions would men divided in so many ways be able not merely to avoid destruction but to live together relatively well on one planet and of course that's also part of democracy's international resonance is it's about peacemaking it's supposed to be about conciliation and in some ways Aaron's text revisit some of the core themes which Aaron and Martin uses, Aaron as a lightning rod, um, it gives the reader a set of tools to think about uh, international relations and about democracy in Western Europe. And Aaron delineate, delineates three core components that make up the ability of one political unit to impose its will on another one. It needs territory, it needs resources, and it needs the collective capacity for action. And that's a challenge for democracies because part of it is how do you generate collective capacity for action? Um, and what he's getting at is the way that internal politics also shape countries external policies. So, and that's what Martin helps us see in this book. It's actually the type of European, Western European democracy that he delineates is also a version of, of, of international order. It helps, un, helps us understand why international relations also take the very distinctive color and shape that they do after 1945. And the novel, novelty of Aaron's book is this stress on collective capacity for the action of a state. Um, and so it's really the characteristics of American democracy, at least as he saw them in the 60s and 70s, alongside its geographic advantages, so its territory and resources, that enabled it to assert its power globally in ways that no other state in the 20th century could match. And of course, partly, um, you know, I mean, I know our concern isn't so much America, but it's in our mind in relation to democracy very much at the moment when America couldn't generate collective capacity for action as a democracy in the 1920s and 30s, it withdrew from the international stage. So you need to be able to generate that for America to, to play a role internationally. And of course, we can see the challenges and the risks to the international order currently of, of a, a, an ambivalence about America's position. Uh, and of course, authoritarian states don't have that difficulty, which is the other phenomena that we're, you know, we can see very visibly at the moment. Martin's book isn't directly concerned, of course, with international institutions or with questions of global order and world peace, but it nevertheless actually helps us understand some of the key contours of it and Western Europeans' place in it after 1945. Institutions like the United Nations and the European Economic Community also, as Martin has shown in the book in relation to Western, European, Western Europe's democratic age, also had a preference for cooperation around economic and social questions, focusing on hunger, housing and economic growth. There was also a general failure to engage with a more radical approach on questions in relation to equality, on race, on gender and and to challenge the operations of capitalism. So in some senses, the kind of grayness that Stathis uh, referenced, uh, and, and Mark actually tried to put a bit more uh, technicolor back in by stressing it's nevertheless a revolutionary moment. That kind of grayness also inhabits the international order into which Western European states are situated. They, are, they, are, they reflect it, but they also help, help generate it. 
The other thing, of course, that starts to happen at the end of Martin's book, and it's there at the moment when Aaron uh, is writing Peace and War, is that the, the contours of a different sort of set of phenomena come into view. Rachel Carson and Barbara Ward were both writing around the same time as Aaron in the 60s. And these two women opened up very big questions about the environmental limits of the planet and questions of global inequality. So they're beginning to sketch out transnational cross currents that shift the state centric land language of stability and order into debates about global challenges. And so we start to see the way that Western European states and the Western European democratic project is situated in a, in a kind of choppier, um, more turbulent set of waters. And I think that that's where I'd like to end my remarks, really, just uh, with an eye also on the time and allowing Martin to, to, uh, to, to reflect and, and, and answer any of the issues that we brought up, is that um, classically European historians have talked about and thought about the 20th century as moments of crisis and stability. And I think what Martin helps us start to see is really that, um, that, that, that this problem that Europe faces is connected to a, a much more turbulent set of issues, that there aren't moments of crisis and stability. Everything is slightly more stable or less stable if the waters are more turbulent or less turbulent. And it also brings out that the challenges that Western Europe faces and it's through its democratic age are really global historical problems. They don't just affect this part of the world. So thanks, Martin, for all of the thoughts that you've provoked. And uh, I look forward to hearing your comments uh, and reflections on, ours, on our points and any of the questions that have come into the chat. Great, thank you very much. Those were three very interesting uh, responses. And I'm most grateful to everybody for their work on, on thinking about thinking this through, because they were very much thinking in motion, thinking uh, projects of actually thinking through the book. And I'm very grateful to everybody for that. Um, you know, Status's comments about the grey temper of democracy in Western Europe after 1945 are very much the ones I'm trying to bring across. Whether you like grey or not, I'm not quite sure. But, you know, it certainly there is a very strong sense of trying to draw the sting out of the sort of democracy that, in retrospect, Germans decided to destabilise their country after 1918 and to create a much more managed democracy. The slogan that Weimar is not going to be uh, the bond is not going to be Weimar. It's very central to the way in which they're thinking about this process of democracy. And there is, isn't there, in all the comments that people have made today, a, a very real sense that actually Europeans keep on thinking about democracy, keep on uh, trying to learn lessons about democracy and trying to manage it through new stages in its development. But they don't always succeed. And I'm most grateful to Mark and um, and indeed to status for emphasizing the conflicts that are also happening here. And I've been very interested in the way in which a conversation has developed between us about what happened next in democracy, whether it's to be understood in terms of, which I think is largely what I suggest in the book, that somehow Europe lo loses a governing model of democracy, or whether Europe is in fact, as status suggests, going through cycles of democratic contestation and radicalization that are followed by periods of stabilization. For myself, I think the answer to Status's question would depend on what you actually think of the sort of neo-market moment at the end of the 20th century, around 1989, that I suppose I lived through and therefore I tend to experience much more as a period of contestation than one of uh, stabilization. But it certainly is that sort of, isn't there, that very characteristic Fukuyama moment of democratic celebration after 1989, which did for a moment seem to freeze uh, Europe West and East in a new particular model of democracy, over which there was this arch, arch, uh, supporting arch of the European Union. But the comments of everybody also take me back to the, my real subject matter, which is in the post-war period. And you know, Mark's point about the violence of purging, about the, the way in which there isn't a suppressed mood of revolution is something I would absolutely agree with. And I hope I didn't take that out of the story in the book. What I want to emphasize is that how state forces very much work to keep that under control and to channel it into particular directions. Indeed, purging is perhaps one of the ways of channeling it because it takes it away from more radical questions about regime formation and instead focuses it on guilty men and women or whatever and focuses it on the creation of a new sort of purged democratic culture. And I'm very struck by how Western Europe after 1945 also thinks of itself as having lost a lot of people, including its Jewish minority. 
and therefore thinks of itself as white and more homogenous than had formerly been the case. And I don't think that that's necessarily, well, it certainly isn't a very good thing, but it's one of the ways in which a West European identity develops. But also, I think Mark is very right to point to this kind of dialectic between social democrats and Christian democrats as the two dominant political forces, how far they find ways to agree particularly at a local level, often in municipal politics, how they find ways to disagree over larger issues. And one tends to think of that in terms of the loss of a rather more militant Catholic Christian dimension, especially with the Second Vatican Council. But I'd also point to the way in which, isn't it interesting that social democracy in Western Europe after 1945 or perhaps after 1950 loses that society changing dynamic and instead takes refuge in a language of the uh, incremental change of a modern uh, of a modern society where things are never going to change in a radical way and therefore social democrats and christian democrats can find plenty of issues to agree about when for example in belgium they often rule together but can argue hugely but to no particular point about state schools versus catholic schools which are, is clearly a really rather secondary issue i should leave it there and let others respond Maria, do you have any questions from the chat? There are no questions from, from the audience, I'm afraid. Well, can, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? I mean, you, you're quite serious about this idea of cycles of radicalization and, cons and consolidation in democratic history in the last 50 years or so? Uh, yes, in, indeed, I've been thinking very much about this um, uh, because I've been very sort of... Um, uh, involved in this present debate, um, and if you if you look at the uh, at the uh, the main thrust uh, of a lot of reactions uh, to the uh, Donald Trump election in 2016, uh, you you know you, you distinguish you, you find two things. The first one is um, an absence of uh, uh, of memory about how politics were be before that. There is a sense that everything was going right, everything was settled. Uh, in a sense, everything was gray, but gray was good. And then suddenly we have this kind of challenge and it's the end of it. So that was my, my first reaction that, you know, in fact, the history of democracy in Europe and elsewhere has not been as um, uh, uniform, as homogenous, as assumed in present day sort of analysis. And the second thing is I, I see this kind of, um, uh, of, of cyclicality in the sense that when, when things are too gray, people want excitement. When things get too excited, people want to go back. And there is this wonderful film uh, by Federico Fellini, which is um, uh, the director, the orchestra director. I don't know if you've seen it, which basically uses an orchestra that uh, revolts against the maestro uh, in the name of uh, self-management. Um, and it collapses. And then at the end, uh, it sort of reconstitutes itself. And, and Fellini gives it a very ominous uh, interpretation. He, in a sense, he's suggesting that fascism is coming back. But it may just be that the nature of things is such that when we don't have enough passion, when, when there is not enough passion in politics, people become disengaged, and now it goes down. Um, people are not interested in politics, and then passion comes back. Everyone is interested. The turnout in elections goes up, but everyone is worried at the same time. So there is a... Berthes, you remind me of, a, of an Afghan taxi driver I've had who said to me, um, in response to the turbulence in this country, that it was a consequence of the fact that people had been too comfortable and been watching football and going to the pub. Whereas in Afghanistan, you could never stop being engaged in politics precisely because it was so. So, you know, it might be that that perspective is like also a kind of European one that we we settle down, but in certain parts of the world, it's never been peaceful. It's never been democratic. Exactly, and the, you, you ask yourself, you know what is the uh, the the, the, uh, the content of how does the, the 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 word normal sound? Sometimes normal sounds bad, sometimes normal sounds good, and that gives you an indication of where you are. But it's very obvious after 1945 that a lot of West Europeans said they wanted to get back to normality, and you know which was a very dominant phrase after the exceptionalism of the war years. But of course that normality didn't exist anymore; it had been blown apart you know, bombed from on sky or populations have been moved around. But the, the less accept, the less available normality is, the more people are more inclined to use the word, perhaps. Just like now. There's the famous saying that uh, may you live in interesting times, which always takes on a, on a very sort of negative uh, tinge, depending on, on, 
when you know yes. it. I think, you know, probably what Mark and I would both say about your argument is that it doesn't necessarily bring out the sort of radicalism of a certain sort of right wing populism or the, the sense of anger generated by marketization of European societies, which I think is very different from the world that I'm describing, when actually people could look forward with a certain sort of predictability to a, a modestly better future. So I think I think at this, this is a good point uh, to finish our book at lunchtime. I'd like to thank uh, Martin Conway for writing this book uh, and for being here with us. Patricia Clavin, please thank you so much for sharing our panel. Mark Mulholland and Stavis Kalivas. I, I just I'm really really uh, I'm really enthused by the, by this conversation. I'm coming from literature, so uh, I, I've learned a lot today, and I feel this is a conversation that needs to continue. Hopefully at a pub or somewhere social in normal times <laughs> and I'm using that type of normal so thank you very much I welcome the I thank you to the audience for being here and uh, I, I like I said at the beginning please take a look at our schedule because we have some great uh, book at lunchtime series um, episodes occurring next week and until the end of term thank you very much everyone thank you thank you, thank you.